This is the first in a series of eight lectures on the great doctrine of salvation. Of all the songs in the hymn book that we use at Thomas Road, I think one of my favorite choruses is that little chorus, Thank You, Lord. And actually, we sing the chorus, but the words themselves are very good. I mean, the stanzas. And let me read them to you. Some thank the Lord for friends and home, for mercies sure and sweet. But I would praise him for his grace. In prayer, I would repeat, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Of all the studies that we shall make, certainly nothing is more important than the doctrine of salvation. And I believe that apart from my book on the doctrine of prophecy, entitled The King is Coming, and the other book, that manuscript from outer space on the doctrine of the Bible, and these are actually the doctrinal studies that have been amplified, but apart from these two, uh, the most uh, extensive work that I have done on the Twelve Basic Doctrines is in the doctrine concerning the doctrine of salvation. And of all the words in the Bible, I suppose the most important two words would be the word God and the word saved or salvation, because the first word speaks of the person of this universe, and that's God, and the second word speaks of the achievements of the person of the universe, and that is salvation. Uh, Jonah, I think, summarized the entire Bible in one little sentence in the book of Jonah, in the belly of the fish, when he said, salvation is of the Lord. So we now study the doctrine of salvation. We're going to approach this along a 12-fold uh, avenue. And this is the perfect number in the Bible, and it speaks of the <clears throat> perfect salvation. We'll be looking at the meaning of the word, a half uh, study, I suppose, is in studying our half of a, let me start that sentence again, I think a student probably is half finished in his study of a subject if he knows the meaning of it, that's what I'm trying to say, and can rightly define it. So we'll look a few moments at the meaning of the word salvation, and then the source of our salvation, from whence comes salvation, various false hopes of salvation, Roman numeral three, and then God's threefold method of salvation, that's four. And then the work of the Trinity in salvation, Roman numeral five. The costliness of our salvation, point six. And then various Old Testament types, uh, foreshadows of salvation, and that's seven. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on Roman numeral eight, the vocabulary of salvation, 15 key words in the doctrine of salvation. Words like conversion, and none of these words are the same, uh, that is to say have the same meaning, although they add to the other meanings. Uh, salvation may be pictured as a diamond with 15 faucets, as it were, to it, facets, I should say. Uh, conversion, substitution, reconciliation, propitiation, remission, these are words in the vocabulary of salvation, redemption, regeneration, imputation, adoption, supplication, that's prayer, of course, justification, sanctification, glorification, preservation, and origination. We'll get into uh, the subject there of uh, where did our salvation originate from? Did it come from God? And if so, what is involved in the words predestination and election and words to that effect? So the vocabulary of salvation. Then Roman numeral 9, the accomplishments of salvation. We're going to see a list offered by one author of some 66 
results or accomplishments, the things that happen, uh, the split second that the sinner accepts Jesus Christ as personal Savior, he receives 66 things. And then the completeness of our salvation. Uh, does the Bible speak only the salvation of souls, or is the salvation of the body and spirit involved also? Roman numeral 11, the security of salvation. Uh, does the Bible teach a whole, W-H-O-L-E, a complete, or a holy, H-O-L-E-Y, an incomplete salvation? And finally, the assurances of salvation. How can I know as a believer, as a child of God, that I am truly saved? So keeping this 12th point outline in mind, we go now to Roman numeral 1, the meaning of the word salvation. And of course, as we have it defined here, that salvation is to successfully affect the full delivery of someone or something from out of impending danger. Now, there's a number of implications of that statement, from that statement, and I've listed two here. A salvation implies that someone or something needs to be saved. You don't worry about saving a person who is in no danger of something. So that's the first implication. And secondly, that someone not only needs to be saved, but that someone is able and willing to save the person who needs to be saved. So those are the twofold implications of salvation. Number one, that something or someone needs to be saved. And secondly, that someone or something is able to save that someone or something that needs to be saved in the first place. And of course, Jesus Christ is that person who is able and willing to save the creature that's lost. And the creature that's lost is man. And if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that all men are sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the sinner is pictured as a dying person that needs a doctor. He's desperately ill. Isaiah 1, 6, Isaiah describes Israel's condition, but really it is a, a very clear description of all sinners. He says that that nation was filled with wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. And so it is uh, with the sinner. He needs a doctor. Not only that, but he needs a lawyer because the unsaved person stands accused and condemned in God's court of law. We saw that when we examined the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 to 19. Uh, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then it gives this terrible indictment of mankind. And then the final bottom line summary is that let all the world, uh, every mouth be closed and all the world stand guilty before God. So man needs a lawyer because he's accused. He needs a doctor because he's desperately ill. And he needs a lifeguard because in a very real sense of the word, he is drowning. The scriptures say in Psalm 69 that the waters of iniquity and the waters of sin and affliction have, have all but drowned me. So man is drowning, he's dying, and he's condemned. That's the first implication of salvation. Someone needs to be saved, and that someone is that creature once made in the very image of God, homo sapien, man himself. And then you'll notice the various reasons, and we won't go into this, why men are lost. Dr. Robert Gromacki has listed some five of these reasons, six of them, I should say, on why men are lost. But the second implication now is this, that someone is able and willing to save. And, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ answers both these requirements, and these are requirements, because a Savior, a would-be Savior, number one, must be able to save. 
There are doubtless many people that are willing to save people but are not able. I think of medical doctors and often those who work with children. And I don't think a doctor ever, I talked, I have a friend who uh, uh, works with uh, children who has leukemia. And he said, you know, you never get used to, I don't care how many cases you deal with, you never get used to a child uh, coming down with this disease and watching the parents and then the child slowly die. And this doctor, friend of mine, is more than willing uh, to save. He'd, I think in some cases, perhaps lay down his life if he can invent a cure for leukemia. He's willing, terribly willing, to save these condemned children but he's not able. So a savior must be willing and able. So there are some that are willing but not able to save, and there are some folks in other situations that are able but not willing. Some time ago I read the account in my reading of history, and I can't remember any of the dates or the circumstances, but it was, uh, I guess, in the 1880s when uh, perhaps 1870s, when after the Civil War, General Custer and his troops were massacred by the Indians in the western part of our United States. And uh, the story goes, though, that Custer was a very unpopular general. He was arrogant uh, to the extreme, and he made a lot of enemies, not only in the South when he fought in the Civil War, but among his own peers in the North. And there was another uh, general... Uh, who watched this terrible battle in which Custer was, was uh, eliminated from the earth and his troops were massacred to, down to the last man, I think. And he watched the battle several miles away on a hill. And even though he denied it uh, later on in an inquest, I think it's been demonstrated by history, that he could have saved Custer. He was able, but he wasn't willing because he didn't like the man. So a savior is one who must be willing and able to save. And Jesus Christ, of course, is both. He meets both requirements. He's able to save. There's no doubt about that. The Bible says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly above all else that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Paul says, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him. The book of Hebrews says, Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Some time ago, a pastor friend of mine from Kentucky told this story of a conference. Uh, by the way, let me just say that the word able in the Greek, uh, or in the Latin rather, it's a... It's a uh, uh, it's a word uh, that's used by Latin theologians many times, uh, and it's called, uh, the name of the, the word is passe. Passe is able. Uh, so the Latin theologian would use the word passe, non bicari. Bicari is sin, so able not to sin. We've gone through that, and not able to sin, non passe, non bicari. But the, the Latin word for, uh, for uh, able is passe. But at any rate, with this background, this fellow knew that word, and so he attended a, a conference, uh, and he said there were uh, three uh, speakers there, and, and the first uh, preacher was uh, uh, a sort of a gloom a spreader, and he got up, and, and uh, he, he didn't see anything good in Christianity or in the world uh, in which he lived. And so when he finished, everybody was about ready to, to slip their wrists. And so then the second speaker got up, and he was the eternal optimist, and everything was, was just rosy, and at every day and every way he thought we were getting better and better, and it was just a matter of time until we would usher in the millennium. And then the third fellow got up, and he said, well, he said, my first, uh, the predecessor here, he said, was, uh, was a pessimist, and he said, the second man that uh, followed him right before me was an optimist. He said, but he said, I'm not a... Uh, pessimist nor an optimist. He said, I'll tell you what I am. He said, before I tell you, though, he said, you know, I was sitting back there, and, and he said, I was listening to those two speakers, and, and I used to think about uh, growing up in the hills here of Kentucky, and we used to 
we used to, to eat possum and turnips as a boy, and he said, and then somebody told me, and I got to think about those possum meals, and then somebody told me, he said that the word Abel in the Greek or in the, the Latin is posse, and then I got thinking about the possumist, and he said, so I'm not an optimist. He said, and I'm not a pessimist. He said, I'm a possumist. He said, I believe that Jesus is able, and even though things are bad, he's able uh, to do exceeding above that which we are able, uh, which we are able to even to, to imagine or to think. So Jesus is not only able, uh, the believer is a possumist, but he's willing. And that's as important as being able. He's able to save us and he's more than willing. In fact, he's anxious to save us. And you have these scriptures here for your uh, study. Thinking of the leper here. They, they came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. See, this uh, leper had no, apparently, uh, problem, no doubt, concerning the ability to Jesus. He said, I know you can do it if you will, but will you? And Jesus said, I will. So our God is not only able, uh, but he's willing. Man of sorrows, what a name, the songwriter has said, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. He is able and he is willing. All right, now, the meaning of salvation, and we've looked at that, to deliver, uh, fully affect the deliverance of something or someone, and then the source of salvation the source of salvation, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our source, and we've already pretty well discussed this under point number two. And then the false hopes of salvation. The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we have listed in your notes a number of ways. Number one is education. I remember my dad talking, my grandfather actually, talking at the turn of the century. He said that in his little town where he lived in Patterson, Illinois, uh, that the great hope in the, those early years from 1900 to about 1912, 1914, the great hope of the world was education. There had not been a war since 1865 as far as the United States government was concerned. And that was some 50 years, and uh, people pretty well had determined that war had been outlawed and that education now was the great savior uh, of the world, would be the great savior of America, and that all we had to do was guarantee a good education for our children. They could learn the principles of reading, writing, arithmetic, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that, but that would in itself do it. Uh, but with the advent of World War I that was actually planned by some of the most educated men in Europe, uh, then that hope was laid uh, to an early grave. Some of the most depraved criminals on earth <clears throat> have been educated men. Uh, again, using our country as an illustration, in uh, the 20s in Chicago, Illinois, Two of the most educated young Jewish boys, perhaps in that city and maybe in the nation uh, at that time, uh, their names were uh, Frank uh, Loeb and Nathan Leopold. And these two Jewish boys, both brilliant students <clears throat> at the University of Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, took a 14-year-old boy uh, by the name of Bobby Franks and brutally murdered him. Two educated boys. It's been rightly said that uh, a bum uh, will get on a railroad boxcar and steal something out of the boxcar, and then you give him education, and he'll devise a plan to steal the locomotive and the entire train. So education is certainly not the savior 
of the world. And then these others, I don't think we need to comment on them, church membership and good works and baptism, proper environment. We have the environmentalists today now that feel that they can somehow pass the legislation <clears throat> in certain areas. I'm sure this is needful, uh, but uh, they need to keep in mind, and we need to keep in mind, that the first pair of human sinners lived in the perfect environment, Adam and Eve and yet they sin. So proper environment and ecology and all the rest is certainly not the answer to salvation. And then the keeping of the law and confirmation, living by the golden rules, sincerity, lodge membership, tithing, secular organizations. <clears throat> In my uh, some brief stay on this earth of 45 years, uh, I've gone uh, at least heard about the fair deal and the new deal and I've at least heard about the square deal in the days of Teddy Roosevelt. I wasn't alive then, but I, I did hear about that, I read about it in history books. But I've actually lived through the, the new deal of Roosevelt and the square deal of, uh, or the fair deal, I should say, probably of uh, Truman. And then some of the other presidents, someone said the raw deal. <laughs> but whatever, <clears throat> secular organizations and the great society and the new frontier and all these other organizations cannot and will not bring peace to this world. And not only will secular organizations not do that, but certainly neither will religious organizations like the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches and all the other religious organizations. So these are but a few false hopes that spring up as a flower <clears throat> but are cut down and die in a day and are buried and you never hear from them again. All right, the meaning of salvation, the source of salvation, the false hopes of salvation, and then God's threefold method of salvation. While God has indeed dealt with his creatures under different dispensations, he saves them through the identical threefold method. Now, we that believe in the various economies of God or the dispensations uh, would acknowledge the fact that God looks upon me in a little different manner than he looked upon the Israelite in the Old Testament. And some of the promises that God gave to that Israel citizen, he does not necessarily give uh, those to me. For example, God promised that if the Israeli person would obey him, that he would not be forced out of the land of Palestine, but that he, would, he could be guaranteed to live in that land uh, as long as he wanted, if the Israelis would have gone along with that. God does not promise me as an American that if I behave myself and that Americans behave themselves that we can stay here in America as long as we want. We don't know. It may be in God's perfect will for a great persecution to take place in America. Maybe some of us will be driven out uh, back to Europe uh, from whence we came because of our faith. We don't know. But in spite of the fact that God does not always deal with individuals the same way under different economies, yet as far as salvation, he always saves them through blood, through a person, and salvation is always by grace, regardless of whether you were saved uh, living before the flood or after the flood, before the law, after the law, in the days of Christ or in the days of the early church in the book of Acts, whether you've lived the last 2,000 years between Pentecost and 1977, when this tape is being made, whether you live in the tribulation or whether you live in the millennium, because people will be saved in the millennium, they'll always be, have always been, are being, always will be saved through these three methods. Salvation is always by blood. Hebrews 9.22 is an eternal statement when it comes to being saved, for the Bible says, without the remission, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Salvation is always by blood. It's secondly, it's always through a person. 
Jonah, again, would summarize that principle when he said salvation is of the Baptist church. I may have misquoted that statement. I'll tell you I surely did misquote it. No, what it says is salvation is of the Lord. It's always through a person. And that's the great thing about Christianity. Christianity is not the application of certain principles. Christianity is the acceptance of a person, and that person is Jesus. And then the third thing about this salvation, it is always by grace. For by grace are ye saved, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, grace through faith, lest any man should boast. Now, Roman numeral 5. We've looked at the meaning, the source, some false hopes, the threefold method, and now the work of the Trinity in salvation. And in your notes, you'll see we have taken from Stephen uh, Swihart uh, the various things involved in salvation in regards to the Father, what part he plays in this, and then the Son and then the Holy Spirit. I think I've quoted this poem to you before concerning salvation. You know, the devil had a part in it too. At least he uh, is mentioned in the story of salvation and goes this way concerning salvation. Now, the Father wrought it. He thought it up in the first place. The Father wrought it. The Son bought it. He paid for it. The Spirit taught it. It's called conviction. The Father wrought it, the Son bought it, the Spirit taught it. The devil, what did he do? He fought it and still fights it. The rich man sought it, Nicodemus. The dying thief caught it on the cross. And thank God, I've got it. So I'll go through that again. The Father wrought it, the Son bought it, the Spirit taught it, the devil fought it. The rich man sought it, the dying thief caught it. And thank God, I've got it. The entire Trinity, and we'll see this later on, actually, when we come to the eternal security of the believer, is involved not only in getting me saved, but the Trinity is involved in keeping me saved once I am saved. Okay, now, Roman numeral 6, the costliness of salvation. There are two great works of God in the universe. One is the work of creation. The other is the work of redemption. Of all God's works, I suppose the Bible talks more about these two because everything else in the universe that you can imagine, whether it's of a spiritual or physical nature, falls naturally under one of these two categories, either God's work as a creator or his work as a redeemer. And we're going to see here that his second work is infinitely more expensive than his first work. What was his first work? The work of creation. Notice in the first few verses of Genesis it speaks about this, and the Bible says that when God had created all things, in six days he rested from his creation. And from that time on, he's not had to do anything else. He just sort of put this plan in motion, and he's not creating now, and he's not uncreating, because once he had done it, it was finished. Um, we hear scientists talk about of nebulae and stars being created, uh, but that's all fanciful imagination. Uh, one of the great laws of physics is the first law, thermodynamics, and that says that energy cannot be destroyed, nor can it be created. It could be changed from one form to another, but God's work of creation is finished. But in the New Testament, we have God's greatest work described, a work that has, is now going on, even though in itself it's finished too, and that's the work of redemption. And as we said before, Redemption is trillions of times more costly than God's first work of creation. 
David brings this out, and Isaiah does also, I think. David prayed in Psalm 8. He said, When I consider the stars, the work of thy fingers... So in symbolic language, now David says that it took God's fingers to create us. But in Isaiah 53, Isaiah says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And again in symbolic language, Isaiah says, that Whereas it took God's fingers to create us, it took his arms to redeem us. He spoke the works of creation, but he bled the work of redemption into effect. With the precious blood of Christ, Simon Peter says, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, we have the angels in the song of heaven there and what they're doing is thanking God for his first work, that of creation. Let me read it to you. The four and twenty elders and the living creatures fall on their face and worship him, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So in Revelation 4, you have the song of heaven depicting the creative works of God. But in Revelation 5, verse 9, you have a new song describing the redemptive works of God. And they sang a new song. See, this is not the song of creation. It's a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain, and hath redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hath made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The costliness of salvation, far more expensive uh, than that of creation. Now, Roman numeral 7 the Old Testament types of salvation. The Old Testament, of course, uh, prepares us for the New Testament. Someone has said the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I think up to a point that statement is true. I guess Luther first uh, said that. Uh, I would in general agree with it. But... Uh, we do have foreshadows in the Old Testament of those things that are clearly revealed in the New Testament. And certainly this is true in matters of salvation, among other things. For example, the Adam and Eve episode illustrates, I think, that salvation clothes us. You see, the, na the sinner, like Adam and Eve, is naked before God. One of the first things they did, when they realized they had sinned, they knew they were naked, and they attempted to hide their sin from God by sowing fig leaves. And uh, <clears throat> I believe that they were saved, by the way, because they allowed God later to slay an animal and to dress that animal uh, and to prepare coats of skin, and then ask Adam and Eve to wear those coats of skin. So this is a beautiful type of salvation. I think they were saved on the basis of Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. So Adam and Eve, think of that, we think not only of creation, but if we know uh, and rightly divide the scriptures, I think, and apply uh, some of these Old Testament events that can speak not only of creation, but of redemption. Adam and Eve illustrating that salvation clothes us. Then another Old Testament type of salvation is found in the uh, life uh, of their two boys, Cain and Abel, <clears throat> who offered different sacrifices. And Cain's sacrifice was a bloodless sacrifice, but Abel's illustrates that salvation guarantees us acceptance. 
It's a tragic thing <clears throat> to be rejected by anything, uh, whether it's a job, uh, whether it's a sorority or fraternity, uh, whether it's a church or a school or whatever, uh, a courtship. No one likes to be rejected. And salvation, though, <clears throat> as we examine the life of Cain and Abel, especially the, the offering of Abel, uh, we are assured that God's salvation promises us that we will indeed be accepted in the Beloved. And then the ark and the Passover. These are two different events. One is found in, in uh, Genesis chapter 6 and the other in Exodus chapter 12. But they both relate the same lesson of salvation because they illustrate that salvation protects us from God's wrath. In Genesis 6, God was planning to send a universal flood, and it was the ark that protected, Moses, protected Noah and his wife and their three wives and uh, their three sons and their three wives, a total of eight people. The ark protected them against God's wrath. And, of course, the Passover. God was going to send the death angel over the land of Egypt, and the Passover lamb protected the life of the eldest child in that home uh, from the avenging lamb uh, or the avenging angel of God. So both these Old Testament examples illustrate that whatever else salvation does, it protects me from God's wrath that right now, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And then the very touching account of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22 illustrates that salvation provides for me and for you an acceptable substitute, not just a substitute, but one that God will accept in my stead. It guarantees us an acceptance, an acceptable substitute. And then the event of the manna, and later on the smitten rock, illustrates that salvation satisfies us. You remember the manna and the smitten rock satisfied the children of Israel. Daniel W. Whittle has written a song that uh, I think describes uh, this illustration of the manna and smitten rock. I'm sorry, John W. Peterson, rather. He's looking at a different page here. And John Peterson, who's still alive and in good health at the making of this tape, has written a song entitled Springs of Living Water. And this is what salvation does uh, to the sinner when he accepts Christ. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. How sweet the living water from the hills of God! It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. O oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied, drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul, they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. O oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. What does salvation do? According to the manna, that living bread, later the Lord Jesus, and the smitten rock, that living water, salvation satisfies us. I used to smoke quite a bit, and I'd smoke Chesterfield cigarettes, and every time I'd light up a, a cigarette from a pack of Chesterfields, I would see that little slogan on it, and it would uh, really just... Uh, well, it would show me, I suppose, remind me how inconsistent it was to smoke. 
because it said, Smoke Chesterfields, they satisfy. Well, if they satisfied, I would often wonder, of course, in my foolishness, I, I wondered, but I didn't quit for many years. If they satisfy, I wonder why they put 20 in a package. They don't satisfy, but the manna and smitten rock illustrates that God's salvation does satisfy. And then the brazen serpent is another example, the Old Testament illustration, illustrating that God's salvation cures us. Remember, this was the passage found in Numbers 21 that Jesus used in John chapter 3 to cure a religious leader from a fatal sin bite, and the leader's name was Nicodemus. And salvation cures me from my deadly bite of sin, just as that brazen serpent once cured the Israeli in the wilderness uh, from his deadly bite of the literal serpent in those days. Then salvation, uh, as depicted in the Old Testament, the life of Naaman and how he was cured, illustrates that salvation cleanses me, not only cures me uh, from disease, but it cleanses me from immorality. Naaman was the only man in all the Old Testament ever to be healed of leprosy. There was a woman, Moses' older sister, by the name of Miriam, of course, that was healed of leprosy. The only reason she was, though, it was divinely uh, instituted because God was punishing Miriam for something she had done, and then Moses prayed and God removed the leprosy. She probably didn't have it very long, over a period of 24 hours, but... But the only bona fide case of leprosy, Israeli or Gentile, in the entire Old Testament, was the uh, case of Naaman. And you remember that uh, precious story in 1 Kings 5, how he went down into the uh, River Jordan uh, seven times and came up the seventh time. This dying leper now came up with skin, the skin of a baby, it cleanses thus, and then finally, in the Old Testament types, we find the tabernacle illustrating salvation restores lost fellowship. Remember when we discussed the book of Exodus, especially the events that took place at Mount Sinai where Israel uh, stayed for some 11 months and five days, and we said the three great events in, uh, at that time was number one, the construction of the tabernacle, I'm sorry, uh, was number one, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, and that was the requirement for fellowship, and for a while everything was all right, but then a few days later, you have the second great event, uh, after the giving of the law, you have the corruption at the base of Mount Sinai, the uh, the uh, worshiping of the golden calf. So you have the commandment of the law, but then you have the corruption of the law, and then the third great event, the building of the tabernacle, which was the restoration of that lost fellowship. And so the tabernacle illustrates, because of the glory cloud of God and the sprinkling of blood and everything, that salvation guarantees to me lost fellowship, the fellowship that I never had with God, but the fellowship that my ancestor once had with God before he sinned, when he walked with God in the cool of the day. And so the tabernacle reminds me that as a child of God, I can have an intimate, far more intimate relationship with the Savior than even Adam had before he sinned. Thus far, then, we've looked at the meaning of the word, the source, the false hopes, the threefold method, the work of the Trinity, the costliness of salvation, and the Old Testament types of salvation. And I think it's time for this first lecture to be over.